Hello and welcome back to GI Live London. We are joined right now by another industry legend who has worked with numerous games publishers on titles such as Knights of the Old Republic 2, Fallout New Vegas, South Park The Stick of Truth, Pillars of Eternity, The, Out- the Outer Worlds and frankly countless others. Um, uh, and now owned by Microsoft, Obsidian Entertainment remains one of the most exciting RPG developers in the world and in fact branching out of RPGs, not just RPGs. Mm-hmm. And I'm delighted to be joined by the studio head, Fergus Urquhart. Hello Fergus, hello, welcome. Well, thank you. No, and thanks for that introduction. It makes me sound like maybe more than I am, but yeah. <laughs> I <don't think laughs> or I've so. just survived. I don't know. I think maybe that's a little <laughs> bit of both. Well, yeah. I, well, I'm not entirely sure there's much difference. Um, the, um, <laughs> well, we actually caught up last year. I don't know if you remember. It was uh, in the. Um, it was uh, talking about um, the fact that you know it was with Microsoft at the time. We're doing a few. I was doing a few interviews with um, new, new new studios. Um, mm-hmm. But but how? Uh, and I asked you this back then. It's a year later, mm-hmm. so I'm going to ask you it again. Um, how, how has it been being part of that family? Oh, it's good. Yeah, no, it's, I, I don't know. I, and I probably said it last time, but I'll say it again it, with this, is that I think what's great is that when we first talked with Matt Booty uh, and, and his uh, chief of staff, Mary McGuane, uh, and, then, and then Phil Spencer a little bit after that, you know, their whole thing was about like, hey, this is how it's going to work. You know, you are going to be a studio. Um, you get to continue to do what you're doing. We want you to continue to be who you are and do what you're doing, and we're pretty much going to back off and let you do what you do. Uh, and that was that meeting was uh, July, August, August-ish, somewhere in there in 2018. Um, and that is the same. That's what's we've been doing, right? So it's we get to kind of decide what we're going to do. I mean, of course, we have to be good. I, I always say we have to be good corporate citizens. We can't say, you know what, we really need to go do a fight game in which it's horses versus unicorns right because that's totally in our wheelhouse so we need to go do that no so um so a lot of it is 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 matt in particular you know leaves us to do what we want to do um you know and 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 which has been great and that means we get to focus on the rpgs we'd love to make yeah well that's i've heard this this is the the hands-off approach that microsoft's mm-hmm. taken to acquisitions yeah. generally just Please make us great games and let us know if you need us. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, that's great to hear. I'm really glad to hear. Because there is an acquisition frenzy going mm-hmm. on right now. And it's Absolutely. Of, so we, we here at GR Live have got a load of uh, developers of all shapes and sizes, most of them independent, um, sort of uh, uh, listening to us and, and sort of um, and watching right now. Um, and there is an acquisition going on right now across the whole industry. Mm-hmm. Um but as somebody who's who's accepted a big offer, and I know that you talked about Matt, you'll be up for being acquired, being acquired like years ago. Years and years but, ago. Yeah. Uh, but what advice would you give for studios that are sort of considering either putting themselves in front of a big company or accepting an offer? Well, what would you say to them? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a tough one. I, so uh, the first part is, you know, is, I mean, the first off is do the math. You know, I think a lot of it, I mean, so, you know, that's one of the things we did is, is, because you can, can offers can come in and and you can say, does the math make sense? You know, what what have you been doing? What have you been getting from your work for hires? What can you do your own? What's your royalty streams? So a lot of it is just, I mean, how I've, I guess, how we and I have run Obsidian since we started, and then Black Isle Studios before that is, it's a lot of spreadsheets. You know, I guess it's the unsexy part of game development, but um, although we do use spreadsheets a lot for game development too, but it, but for the business side of it, um, so the first is do the math. I think the thing is, just, and then figure out what is your number. You know, I, I you know, it's hard to say, hey, what, you know. What can you be bought for? Um, I guess that's the horrible way of saying it. But, but a lot of it is is actually that is figuring out what it is that you feel is was is worth your studio because you don't want to like sell your studio and then feel like oh crap, you know like that wasn't worth it or, or you know and and then and then once you and then I think once you do decide that then it, that's the number and be happy with it right and and then and then and move on. But I think the other thing is is obviously there has to be a cultural fit, um, and there has to also be an understanding of what it is that. Why are they purchasing you? So there has to be very has to be absolute clarity on that. So we were approached by a, another major publisher, uh, and I was having lunch with um, one of the one of the one of the main people at the publisher, uh, and you know they said, "Well, have you ever thought about being acquired?" I said, "Yeah, of course." And and then ultimately, what then they said was, they said, "Well, yeah, I mean, we're just having a real hard time hiring people right now." And so, yeah, it would be great to be able to just, you know, buy your studio and then we can take all your people and put them on our projects. You know, so that's, I think, now, I, I guess maybe the number can be large enough and, and that would be fine for you. But I, but I always felt that I, I, 
we only want we always wanted to be a service to our 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 people that our people that have been with us and you know even people that have started about when we sold. So I guess that's the thing is you, it's just understanding you know what's your number, understand your finances, understand why they're making that decision, and then also that like I said it just it, it does have to be a culture of fit. Like you have to be cool being you you have to they have to be people you want to sit down and have a beer with at points in time. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it's not that, then then I think you have to reconsider. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess if you're a studio, depending on the studio, you know, working for uh, on a, on a different project uh, that another for another studio might be a great thing. You know, it might it, mm-hmm. might, it might be a fit. Um, but uh, yeah, and it, uh, I mean, I've had my own experience of a company be, uh, being part of a company that got bought, and I'm not entirely mm-hmm. sure they realised what they were buying, and I'm not entirely yeah. sure we realised who was buying us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and, totally. and, that, and that's where things go really wrong. No, absolutely. I think that I mean, you know, and because it's bigger and the bigger, bigger and bigger the, the the companies are that are being purchased, or even the companies that are purchasing them. I mean, there's only so much due diligence both sides can do, and and mm-hmm. it also still relies upon, uh, it still relies upon people being true and honest and and things like that. I think one of the things I was really super surprised about going through the acquisition process was um, how sort of archaic it is. So that's no, this is no reflection like on Microsoft system. I think Microsoft is super efficient and stuff like that, but it's just like, we would just get like, it was, we were talking about it. Me and one of the other founders, Darren, we're talking about like, Hey, maybe for our next gig, what we need to do is create actually a website that facilitates acquisitions. And so I think that was, that was sort of one of the interesting things. And I think as a part of that, because it's sort of this archaic system of due diligence and send us all your contracts, but I could just say, Oh, I have. You know, I mean, and, and you know, and they a lot of times. I mean, they can figure out if there's contracts that haven't been signed that you, that we've signed that you've not sent. But a lot of it is um, a lot of it is really it really, it really just built on trust and and it's it's what you said. I mean, you can just forget to say something, and then that could matter. It doesn't matter to you, but it matters to them a lot. And and it really is these two companies that are just hoping it's going to work. You know, and I think I think what we were serious about, and maybe that's the best advice I can give to people that are looking through acquisitions, just be upfront. Like, don't try to hide stuff. Like, because okay, so it's it would suck if an acquisition doesn't go through. But a lot of times, I mean, a lot of times, and this was with Microsoft, we just ended up talking about all the things. And I mean, if there's something uncomfortable in a, in a contract. Don't worry about not bringing it up because you're worried they're just going to walk away, right? If if another the other side is going to walk away because of some small point in a contract you don't understand. Well, they probably would have walked away anyway, and so and so a lot of it is is it's it's I think it's almost like what you're saying is almost like you are not you're going in a little a step deeper than what you're saying. It's almost use the acquisition period to kind of learn as much as you can about the other you know as 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 the other party, mm-hmm. and a lot of that is just asking questions, sometimes uncomfortable ones, yeah. um, just so you can get to know them. Make sure you know. It's like I guess you, you're about to get married. Yes, you know, it's make, like make, that weird. Fa- it's like speed dating followed ni- immediately by yeah. immediately by a marriage. Do you, do, 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 do you want kids? You know, find this out before you before you put the ring on the finger. Is exactly. The, uh, How many kids? I think that's yeah. the other. That's the important yeah. question. Well, you've worked with obviously you acquired now, but you've worked with so many publishers down mm-hmm. the years um, outside of Microsoft. I'm assuming Microsoft is the answer. What has been your best experience working with? Um, uh, a, a publisher or a partner. So I think with publishers, a lot of, in a lot of ways, they all bring different things to the table, right? And so, I mean, there are there are times that a, that a working with a publisher is great financially. Sometimes it's great from a um, it put it puts you you know um, it gives you a lot more notoriety. Sometimes it's you're learning something you didn't learn before. And so I can kind of look at a lot of them. You know, from a standpoint, and if I look at it, you know, like, for instance, our first thing with LucasArts uh, and Simon Jeffrey taking a chance on us to do Knights Road Public 2, um, that was great both financially and from and a notor- notoriety standpoint. It was sort of one of the best pieces of advice that, you know, Ray and Greg from Bioware gave me. He said, because I was still like, I don't know, do a Star Wars game. And he's like, he goes, look, they're like, I think the word dude was like, D- look, dude, um, was, which is sort of un-Canadian, but still. Um, and uh, was, look, when you walk into a bank and you're looking for that first loan, or a bank account and you say you're working on Star Wars, everybody knows what that is. And so there was a benefit to that, right? And so I think for everything, every publisher deal and everything we looked at, you know, we did, um, there was benefits. I mean, there was definitely high points. I mean, the the marketing and PR of Bethesda when they're all behind something is just 
amazing and they're just like they're all in i mean and and that is what's amazing when you're working with a publisher and they're all in on something um that's incredible um you know mail.ru with armored warfare they gave us the opportunity to try something we'd never done before and it, it, you know and it, it taught us a lot about you know free to play games maybe so much so that you know maybe we don't want to do free to play games <laughs> you know, you know? You learned and something. <laughs> we learned something yeah <laughs> and um you know and what else um you know and like also like think the marketing and pr and business support from take two on the outer worlds again i mean these are publishers giving you know gave us a shot to create an ip and and uh you know, so I think a lot of it is 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 that um, a lot of it is just is just really like every publisher does have some some uh, something to offer. I guess the one thing that I th I think that has been one of the bigger challenges um, in a, working with a lot of publishers is some is sometimes the, actually the development support. So this is an interesting thing of like particularly when you're a young developer, maybe you're a developer that has not been around for a long time, or it's just not something you're super familiar with. Like luckily we came from Black Girl Studios and we had managed products and and both on the publisher side and the developer side. And so we kind of understood that whole process. Um, but we've had challenges with some of our our um, with a fair number of our of our publishers sort of on the QA front. Um, it's often a fight, and, and even to the extent that in our contracts, we would often try to get things in our contracts about like, hey, you, know, you have to put this number of QA people on this month and be super specific about it. And, and the one thing the publishers don't want to do a lot of times is be specific, which I understand. They want to give themselves the, the opportunity to, to decide later or make decisions when it makes sense. Um, but I would say that there are certain things that you know, we learned over time, like QA, um, you know, where's our logo going to be on the box, you know, because if it's not talked about in the contract, it might not be on the box at all, or it might not even be in the, fr in the, in the you know, the, the thing at the start of the game. Um, and so, um, you know, so I think that's, if I had to say one of the universe, I wouldn't say across all of our publishers, but I would say QA has been a challenge. Um, and then, the, and then, then when you're not working on a, on like an all in product for a publisher, um, it can be super challenging to get PR and marketing support. And so, you know, we, that was another thing we'd often have to be very upfront with and be very pushy on with our, with our publishers. Mm. Was there, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm about to ask you, do you have examples of things that were, were challenging, but I didn't, I don't want you to just like, start um, slang, criticizing your colleagues in the industry. Well, I can, I, you know what I can do? It's, so I can give sort of, so, so it's odd. So, um, long ago on Neverwinter Nights 2, um, uh, uh, and I'm not going to protect the names to uh, to protect whatever, or change the names to protect them. But it, but it's more of like we were working with Atari and Neverwinter Two, and and we were having a challenge on the QA front. Now we were able to sort of work together on a solution, which was we then actually created our own QA department here. Like we actually at one point had 30 or maybe even as many as 35 people in QA just working oh, wow. on Neverwinter Nights Two, and that was the solution there because they were having a challenge with getting enough QA people. Um, so that's a good example. Um, I'm trying to think of like other things. Um, you know, I mean, some of other stuff, I mean, uh, you know, I would say, I mean, again, I don't want to I mean, be mean about this, but like Dungeon Siege 3 was a challenge from the standpoint of PR and marketing. I mean, the great people, but often, you know, there was differences of opinions on how to market and PR it and, you know, different, like the game is this, but we're going to, we need to market in PR like this. Um, and, uh, and also, there, you know, there's other projects. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, I don't know. Um, we're just, you know, you're just, you're just getting fractions of time of someone who's working on six other projects and, you know, which is, which I've always, you know, my argument sometimes to other to publishers have always been, okay, so you're going to go, you're all in for, I don't know, let's talk about an older project, $15 million on this game. Um, and it's going to cost you another $15 million to get it on the shelf. But you are, you know, you have a, an associate PR person on it who has five other projects and you're paying him $50,000. So you're saying $10,000 a year is your, is your, is your, the way to protect your $30 million investment. And, you know, I would try to say that from time to time. I, I can't say that it was successful, <laughs> but, but it, at least it, 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 it brought it down to numbers, which sometimes helps. I've spoken to some, I've spoken to some big developers down the years that partnered with a, a publisher that I was surprised by, like I think uh, uh, Remedy, for instance, and Control with 505 Games. Like, surely you could have gone with any of the big companies. And their reasoning was that, you know, yes, we could, but we'd probably be a B title in their lineup. And mm -hmm. I know that yeah, we're yeah. the A title in this company's lineup. So, mm -hmm. And there was a, there's a benefit to perhaps going with a slightly smaller publisher where you're a bigger player. 
than mm-hmm. um, than a, than, a, than the other way than going for a big company just because they've got a big name. They may have a big marketing department, but how much of that department is going to be dedicated to your title is is the sort of thing that um, you have to find out, I guess. Yeah, and I think a part of it is just don't don't do things that are probably going to get yourself yelled at. Like I think the thing is is that I mean you know I think going back you know when we were first starting City and talking to Ray and Greg from Bioware, I mean you know. I was already having arguments with them, you know, when we were, uh, I'll use quotations, when I was managing them <laughs> in, at the, in, the, in the Black Owl days. No, we were working together. They obviously were, the, I mean, they did all the work, but we did the, a lot of the PR marketing. But again, their goals, our agendas were aligned, but not completely. And so, you know, they very quickly started to have their own PR and marketing people, you know, and then we developed that over time as well. And I think that that, and, and that does create, can it create a certain amount of friction between the publisher and the, because the publisher often says, Hey, we're paying for this. We're in control of it. We need to do all the stuff, which is fine. And it's not logically wrong, but when they then aren't, don't have the people that are actually doing it, you know, you, in essence, you're doing something for the benefit of both party, you know, both the publisher and the developer, but the publisher gets mad because they're not doing it, but you have to do it anyway. I mean, that's the, that's the thing that we figured out. You just have to do it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because there's been, a, I don't know if you noticed this, I hope, there's been a lot of transparency on, on social media, I think on Twitter mm-hmm. in particular, where game developers are sort of sharing their publisher contracts publicly. I don't think this mm-hmm. happened back in the day. What do, you, what do you make of that? You know, I don't know. I mean, first off, um, I mean, back in the day, I, I would have worried, been worried about getting sued because the contracts are all considered confidential and you signed a confidentiality agreement, right? But there isn't, I mean, and particularly, I would say amongst the development community, there's a certain amount of like, a lot of us do talk about the general terms of our agreements. So, so if I, I never felt like if I needed to know something about a contract, you know, I, I could, or I could find what what is the I forgot what they what, what is the when well, I'm not the going rate, but what is the current terms that are acceptable in contracts? Um, you know, I could always find them out, so they didn't need to be public. Um, I think it's I think it's interesting that people are sharing them. The only th- I, the only thing is it, is that I think there may be interesting to people in general, but maybe not as much to other developers, other than some very few points. Like when I think about a contract, and this is the advice that I give to people, like like this contract, you might have to sign a contract that's 60 pages, which is just ridiculous that they have to be 60 pages. But look, in the end, it all matter is, you know, what are you getting paid? How are you getting paid? What are your royalties? What's your earn out? Like, how do you get your royalties? Not just the amount, but like, at what point do you get them? You got to spreadsheet it out. Um, you got to understand your termination. You got to understand what you own and don't own coming out of this. You understand, you know, um, you, you know, understand if how you're going to be um, credited. You know, where your logo is going to be. There's like a list of like I don't know, eight or ten things that I think all that really matters in those contracts. Because in the end, with a lot of the contracts, I mean, a publisher really doesn't want to terminate because. You know, they really don't want to have to take you to court. They really don't. They don't really. None of them really think they're ever going to get their money back if it goes bad. Um, and so, um, and so, a lot of it really is. It's the things that are going to matter in the long term. You know, is really you know, and, and about like how you, like I said, how you get paid and how your royalties work. So, I think it's cool that they're that that they're getting shared. And and I think the point of it though is maybe is really the understanding of what is. Um, the, I would say the market rate. There's a word that the the the, the M&A, the merger and acquisitions people use about contracts. And I can't think of what it is right now. But it's basically what are the going rates for things? You know, is is 12 and a half percent of gross what people are getting paid right now? Is it you know, or does mm-hmm. you know? I mean, I heard back in the day, of course, that you know, ID signed a contract with Activision for like I don't know. 45% of gross or it was, no, it wasn't that, but it was like 37% of gross or something, something crazy. And I'm like, holy crap. Like, how's anybody making money? I mean, other than it, of course. But, um, but I think that, I think a lot of that is, is, um, yeah, that's what I said. I think it's just the, it's just what, it's the interesting thing of people sharing stuff is understanding what, what maybe is the going rates of things right now. Hmm. I guess we've also, we have so many small publishers starting up. I guess it's useful mm-hmm. for them. Like you may think it, you know, it may be a bit critical of them, but it's actually quite useful, I guess, to have, particularly if you've been shamed, even if you've not been named, you know, if your contract has been put out and it's like, mm-hmm. and, they, and it's like, oh, I didn't realize that was wrong. You know, <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, 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 and then you get to correct it, I guess. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you read them. I mean, I, I, I had, a, I have this thing of where I read all our contracts. I know that sounds like a really a silly statement to make, but I know a fair number of people who don't always do a good job of reading their contracts. And I have made some legitimate errors, like, like, I don't, like hundreds of thousands of dollars 
used oh, wow. losing licenses, errors um, in contracts before, that I missed it, the lawyers missed it, even though I read it. Although, you know, a couple times it's because I made this mistake of the contract that starts versus the contract that ends is going to be very different. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, of course, had read the contract six times, and then I didn't do this. My, my more normal thing is when it's the last version of a contract that we're supposed to sign, I go old school. I print it out. I get a red pen, and I literally sit in a quiet room, and I make myself read every single word because something could have changed. You know, like uh, there was this thing where a license got lost was someone introduced this and, like, and slash or to a sentence, and I read it, and everybody read it, and the other side read it. Well, then the license got transferred to a different party, and the different party then read it. And, oh, what it, mean, what it really means, if you really do the grammar, is this. So you don't actually get these three properties. You only get this, this, or this, right? And so then there was a big argument and, and all that kind of stuff. So, but I think the end with contracts here. You just, you just, you got, you got to read the whole, all of them. You got to read them. That's you got to read them. Got to read them. <laughs> well, I, I, that's some wonderful advice already. Um, it's really great. Um, I think lots of people find this super interesting. Um, but well, I guess, but I, I'm going to sort of deviate away from publishing and, and sort of sure. contracts just, just, just for one. I guess this might be our final question because I'm aware of the time. But there's, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of new opportunities opening up in games mm-hmm. for developers to consider. And I know that you, uh, Obsidian, part of Microsoft, must you know involved in almost all of them. I suspect like subscriptions, streaming, there's new consoles and all sorts. Um, what do you think are the key areas that perhaps independent teams should be should be keeping an eye on, paying attention to? Make a good game. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll talk. I'll go into more of it, but I think I think the thing is is like there are opportunities for specific things. You know, I remember. Oh, I can't remember his name. I can th- I can see his face, but I can't remember his name. Of like, gave this great speech about how there was this emerging opportunity in making games for the for the for the Kindle, and I don't mean the Kindle like android version of the kindle i mean the actual like paper kindle thing right. and, and 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 it was super compelling and I, i'm like oh, i should think about this i mean you know and then and of course there was no market for that actually you know what i mean i think he did make some money on it but um uh but i don't think many people did so i think the first thing i mean it really is 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 the game right is just focusing on the game and then as it relates to all the opportunities it really are business opportunities like do you want to make a connect game do you want to make a game that, that is good for streaming? Like, do you like Netflix has an agenda? You know, Microsoft has Game Pass. PlayStation has Gold. You know, I mean, and PlayStation focuses on these type of titles. I don't know. I mean, it's funny when I think about all that stuff and 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 all the things that are out there to do. Like, a part of it is it really is. It's sort of like, well, what do you want to make? What are you good at making? And it's sort of like like we could say. I mean, like forget that we're a developer that's been around for a long time. We said, okay, well, we want to do a subscription service. Okay. Well, then how do we, like, are we making the Outer Worlds better by making it a subscription service? Are we making our kind of RPG, or do we want to make something very different? Grounded, I'm not trying to plug, but I mean, Grounded is an example of something different, right? Like, it, yeah. it, it, it bore out from a, hey, people like survival games. We like survival games. Let's try to make a survival game. You know, and of course, it, I, wish, I, I wish I could, there was, there was a much larger, you know, way of explaining, like, like how do we come to our decisions, but... Um, I'm really taking not much longer of a conversation down to its <laughs> its parts. Uh, but I mean, I mean, obviously, then we, we then we explored it, right? We looked at the numbers and we looked at that. But it's like I guess the thing in the end for us, it's always just been like like how, like we want to make what we want to make, and then and then how do we make sure those are successful? Right. It's looking at, you know, with Grounded, it's looking at like why is Rust successful? Why is why is the forest successful? Why is um, um, why is uh, Lonesome Dark? Did I say that right? Um, uh, the one in the cold, one in the one that's in the yeah. cold. Um, you know, why have these all been? Why have these all been successful? You watching the GDC speeches, you know, and just going, okay. Then I think the thing, then really, your question of opportunity for developers is, is then to go, okay, because that's a, I don't want to call it a marketing or PR decision or or a business decision, but it's like, okay, so we have this thing, we like it, we love it, we can make it awesome. Now, like if we went to, you know, if we went to Facebook and put it on the Quest 2, like does the game fit? Do we still feel good about it? And because we can make it cool for them, they'll give us an opportunity, right? So that's, so you know what I mean? So it's like, for me, a lot of those decisions come down to like, it's, it's almost like a, a, a sales, marketing, and PR decision um, mm. in the end. 
it's about so you build the game and then and then then explore the options that you that that and there's a lot of options out there now right mm-hmm. that, and that's that's the exciting thing is you can go to facebook and put it on the quest too you can mm-hmm. go to mm-hmm. xbox and see if it will go on the game pass and you can go to do ps now or you can do um yeah, maybe not but stadia so you know you mm-hmm. can do you can go in these sort of there's so many different directions you can go in i guess that's um, but you don't don't start from that point. Is that what you're saying? I think I think don't start from the point. I mean, start from this. I mean, obviously, in the end, if you're a new developer and you want to get a game published, just get a game published, right? And then and then you know, but but it can't be this. Um, you know, sometimes I say it don't it don't have it be like a game that you're being made as if you're like you're like controlling a marionette. marionette. And what I mean by that is is like you know you need your fingers in it. You don't need to be kind of like well I I I feel I I want to make it like well. Facebook wants a game that's like this, so we're just gonna like we're gonna go make that. Now, that is a business, right? Like mm-hmm. in essence, that's just wait work for hire development business. And if you want to do that, go for it, right? You know. So I guess a lot of it is is, is where do you want your business to go? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, do you want to establish yourself? Then go find those opportunities. You know, if you want to then establish yourself and then go make your own thing, um, then follow that strategy. So in essence, I, a lot of it is 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 the it is, a, I guess, in the end, probably changing what I'm saying. I mean, these decisions on, on kind of where to take your product is, a, is sort of a, is, a, is a company strategy for how you want to establish yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, if your IP is important, like you just care about, like, um, your characters and your world and stuff like that and less about the game, then you can, it could be a VR game, it could be a mobile game, it could be this, it could be that. I don't know. I just also look, I just look at, like, how did all the people that I, I um, respect establish themselves? You know, and so for me, it's always like, I always look at like RPGs. So what are all the different ways that people have established themselves with RPGs and what did they do? You know, and so, and I, and maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it is a, a, uh, it is not a, not the cool thing to say, but like, I don't find that they focused on, at the time, they, they didn't focus on platform. They didn't focus on, they didn't focus on sort of distribution platform, you know, distribution systems or stuff like that. They either this is the game we're going to make. Now, now on the flip side, I mean, they did partner, or and as we have in the past, you would partner with a console manufacturer, you know, who believed in your product. You know, maybe that goes back to what we were talking about before. Is like when you work with a publisher who's all in. So I guess that's the thing. You know, maybe it goes circles all the back. If if you're interested in these and you feel like you can be successful with one of these new, one of these uh, different options. You know, whether it's monetization or it's like game passes or other kind of you know subscription based stuff. You know, then you find a partner who's going to be all in on your game. You yeah. know, maybe that's. You know, that's why I'm saying maybe, but I, I that feels like probably the way that you need to you would need to you know need to go after it. Brilliant. Well, I'm very, very aware of the time, and that was excellent. And I could actually cool. p- pick your brains for ages about this. <laughs> but thank you so much. Absolutely. This. Happy um, to do it. It's always a delight to talk to you, and I can't wait to see more of Avowed and The Outer Worlds too. and I've enjoyed Grounded, and I'm a big fan, so it's, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, that's it for this session. For those of you with tickets, in, just join us in just a moment where we'll be holding a private developer Q&A with Valve. For everyone else, I'll see you in just over an hour where I'm talking to the PlayStation CEO and President, Jim Ryan. Thank you for watching.